So, so as you heard in the introduction, I'm Bradley Kuhn. I work for this organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy. Our primary work at the Conservancy is providing a home to open source and free software projects and initiatives. So we give them the work of being in a nonprofit without having to do it themselves. And that's probably most of what we work on all the time. And we pretty much do whatever tasks those projects need. Now, as it's turned out, we've become the place where projects come when they need to do things that aren't available anywhere else anymore. We're the home for projects that are ones that still want to be a community in the traditional way that free software communities have existed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I feel the Freenode community and IRC in general have these roots that go so far back into free software culture and how that connects up to the kinds of things that we think about at Conservancy. Because in addition to all this work of taking care of projects, we're also kind of a think tank. We, we spend a lot of time worrying about the future of software freedom and how we defend it going forward. So I'll start by uh, saying that I am fortunately uh, presenting from my own box, 100% uh, free software box running LibreBoot uh, uh, on an X200 uh, laptop. Uh, but this morning, you probably noticed there was some, some wonder of whether this would work. So I walk around the world, not walk, I usually take planes, but I wander around the world, I should say, and often giving talks at various different conferences, and it's suddenly become much harder to give talks at conferences. Uh, we spent probably two decades getting VGA to just work everywhere. I I'm old enough that I remember going to conferences and giving talks where you brought your slides on those, you know those overhead sheets? Maybe your professor used them once in a while, okay? Well, you used to always bring those with you as well as your laptop back in the 90s because you never knew if you were just going to have to use an overhead because the laptop wouldn't work. So we spend these years getting VGA standardized. In fact, most of the projectors in most of these places are actually using VGA on the other end, but the assumed setup is a proprietary HDMI connector. Um, so you saw, if you saw Leia's talk this morning, which she did without any slides at all because we couldn't get her laptop working. Um, this afternoon, because we witnessed that, John Sullivan and I came down and uh, you probably noticed we were late for lunch because we were in here testing our laptops every possible way to make sure that they would work. Um, and in fact, they did and, and the AV team here has been excellent to work with us on that because in fact, this AV team, AV team and the entire conference organizing committee comes from a project that's sympathetic to this. Most of the time when I go to a conference and give a talk and say I have only VGA, they just assume I've come out of the past somewhere uh, and don't have any interest or care why it is that I'm carrying a laptop around that only has a VGA connector. Um, here, of course, the team cares. And I'm glad to say that uh, I am presenting from this laptop, but my talk is about this issue, about this problem of going around the world which was for a short time in history a very free software friendly world and is not such a free software friendly world as it once was. So I'm old, I should point out, not as old as Doc and Simon, to be clear, but I'm pretty old. And so I first used IRC in 1993. I was already 20, more than 20 years old at the time when I first used IRC. Um, I felt I was late to the game because people, I heard about people using IRC a couple of years before that and I hadn't used it yet. Um, and I was uh, busy with my first couple of years of university uh, and then said, well, I should use, well, I was doing a summer internship at my university and I also had another job as well, which I don't think I was supposed to do. So I worked days at my other job doing programming and then nights on my research internship. But I would sit there kind of lonely in the lab at like 8 p.m. Uh, in, in the time zone I was in and just get on IRC. So is, is anyone in the crowd use the Zircon IRC client, a Tickle TK IRC client? I only see like three hands. The lights are on my face, so maybe there's more up than that. Uh, but yeah, so I use this IRC client, which in fact I found today, the person who wrote it is actually lives in the UK. From my point of view nearby, I, real, I checked, it's a five hour drive, so I'm sure all of you locals say that's not nearby at all. Uh, but from my point of view, I took a 11 hour pain, one of my plane rides was 11 hours to get here. So for me, this is local. You know, he, he's a local guy who wrote this, um, and his web page is actually still up. Uh, the FTP server with the source code is not. I was going to try to run it and actually try to do a live demo because I thought that would be funny in case it worked, but I could not find the source code of it uh, after about an hour of searching. I, I, it may still work. I don't know. But that was the IRC client that I first used. And 
what's interesting to me is obviously I couldn't even find that code, uh, and obviously it's been replaced many times. I realized that some of the main IRC clients that people still use are based on some of the earliest code, uh, but that's been under active maintenance and active improvement the whole time that you all have been using it. But the interesting thing is that not just that code gets replaced, because I view code as mostly ephemeral. It's strange to hear that from someone uh, like me who's obsessed with software licenses. And if you've seen other of my talks, you've heard me talk about how important it is uh, that your code be licensed under certain software licenses. But that's actually because I'm playing the odds. Every once in a while, a project, say Linux or something like that, Samba, those kinds of projects are going to last for 20, 30 years and become incredibly important code bases. Uh, but that's actually less likely to happen than the code base eventually ceases being of interest and goes away. But we have to plan for the future. We have to pick good licenses for projects because every once in a while, one of us is going to start a project that's really, really important and becomes an essential code base to our future, and it really ought to be under the right license. That, by the way, is all I'm going to say. And of course, the right license is a copyleft license. Everyone should pick one. This talk is not about copyleft licenses, so that's all I will say about that going forward. What I'm most concerned about for this talk is not that we let code disappear. Code's often going to disappear. But sometimes founding principles, founding ideas, things we've worked on for years, like making sure VGA always worked everywhere for every talk. We spent years in the conference speaking community, if you will, making sure that would happen. And in a matter of just a couple of years, it collapsed entirely. And suddenly, you need an HDMI cable, and the converters don't work, and there's all these different converters. And every talk I go to, somebody's asking the audience for some sort of converter to convert whatever they have to whatever's available. So, so why, do, why do we let that kind of thing happen? The other thing that's really interesting to me, and, and more relevant to this conference, given that it's free node live, is IRC has actually survived really well compared to most things that we have. It survived roughly in its existing form, both for good and bad, for almost 30 years now. And that, to me, is really interesting. So here's another place where ideas didn't survive so well. So once upon a time, I, when I was in my late 30s and I got really scared that I was completely irrelevant, because that's what happens to you when you're in technology in your late 30s, I decided I'd better quickly learn how to do this web programming thing, how to be a JavaScript developer. So I bought a book, you know, the things on paper. So I mean, I was old, so you know, I bought a paper book to learn JavaScript. I mean, I would, not that I would you know, use an e-book. I, I needed a paper book. Um, so I bought one, <coughs> but it was written by one of the leaders in the JavaScript field. I won't call out the person who it was, but it, somebody who would consider a leader in JavaScript. And, I, and there was plenty. The, the, the entire first chapter talked about this idea of, well, the two competing ideas of progressive enhancement and or graceful degradation. They're usually juxtaposed with each other. But the most important thing is both of them say, as a fundamental principle, that the website should still work without JavaScript. That you should still be able to render something useful to the user. And there's plenty of great reasons for this. The reason I always felt was easiest is now they invest so much time in making JavaScript websites accessible to people who are visually impaired well, HTML was already accessible to people who are visually impaired because tons of work went in to make that true. So if the site either uses only progressive enhancement or graceful degradation, either one, there's at least a base HTML site that works there. But there's a whole host of other reasons. The main one of my concern, of course, is that most JavaScript is proprietary software, downloaded into my browser, run on my computer. I've often told people, JavaScript is like typing apt-get install from a proprietary repository all day long. Because you download some code, you run it on your own computer, you don't have the source code to it, because by the way, it's not really JavaScript. It's minified JavaScript, which might even be compiled from C, because they can do that, you know? And it's really hard to do things on websites, because no one designs websites with graceful degradation or progressive enhancement anymore. They are just applications written in JavaScript. If I wanted to check into my flight to come here, and I, of course, I'm using no script, as you can see, uh, so I don't allow Java, any JavaScript by default. This is what uh, Delta, my preferred airline in the United States, their website looks if you allow no JavaScript. Um, by the way, if you click on this menu up here, you, you, you don't get a menu. Uh, you get JavaScript void down in the little thing there, and that's it. Um, so 
This is the world we now live in. There was a moment, you see, in the early 2000s when the web was free, when there was no reason to worry about what proprietary JavaScript you were getting because you could just ignore JavaScript all together. Those days I used to browse the web in Emacs with a text-based browser. I don't do that anymore, in part because I can't. I don't even do this very much anymore because I have to click this thing a bazillion times and allow installation of probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lines of proprietary JavaScript code, some of which is probably non-copyleft,ed free software JavaScript code that's been modified by Delta or whoever they subcontracted to to do this. So this is what led me to this conclusion about a paradox that we see in the world today. So every day that I live my life now, I notice that there is more open source and free software in the world than there was any day before it. Going back through the history of time, there's more freely licensed code at the end of today than there was this morning because people are constantly creating new open source and free software in the world. Yet every day it gets a little more difficult to operate in an industrialized society without using any proprietary software. So this to me is a paradox. I, it's probably not a paradox to most people, but the reason I think it's a paradox is because we're in this situation where we're hearing that open source has succeeded. We're seeing what looks like success in the sense of number of lines of code written, yet it's becoming harder and harder. Now, the I'm not gonna spend too much more time talking about this paradox, but one of the reasons I think it exists is that for-profit corporate actors who have seen the financial benefits of collaboration, at least on some types of topics, are dumping large amounts of resources, i.e. revenue for developer salaries, into very specific types of open source and free software projects and ignoring them. We don't ignoring others that are much more important as far as giving software freedom to lots of users. Now, I don't want to talk too much about this paradox other than to apply it to where we are today. So it can also be explained away to say, well, there's more people using software. In the early days of free software, most people using software had some sort of IT-related job. Today, basically everybody uses software all day long, either on a mobile device or as part of their job. Uh, the, the joke that Richard Stallman used to tell, which wasn't really a joke, that if he ever was forced to use, to, to, he would never be forced to write proprietary software or use proprietary software as a job because he would just get a job as a waiter. Recently, I had a two-hour conversation with RMS to finally convince him that he probably couldn't get a job as a waiter that didn't require using proprietary software today because he was thinking of being a waiter in the 1980s where it would be pretty rare in the 1980s for a waiter to use software. Today, most restaurants I go into either have a proprietary software cash register or a proprietary software seating system or some other set of proprietary software that the wait staff have to use to get their jobs done. Now, my view initially was, well, that's okay. Uh, we have always had the challenge of convincing users that software freedom was important. We have to go out into the world and convince them there's a lot more users now, a lot more proprietary software, the job is bigger, it will take longer, just keep working on it. But we won't lose developers, right? That's what I thought for a long time. I thought, okay, developers understand software freedom. Developers don't want to lose their software freedom. They understand that proprietary software is bad. Even proprietary software developers often prefer free software, at least at one time they did. And in fact, we've learned many lessons throughout our culture. Who in the room knows what I mean by the Linux BitKeeper fiasco by a show of hands? Okay, it's about half the audience. I'm gonna spend, for, oh, sorry to bore you that raised your hands, I wanna spend a little time explaining it for the other half who didn't. So there was this proprietary software system. It was probably the first distributed version control system ever invented on the planet written by uh, basically a, a one-person shop uh, development house run by a guy named Larry McVoy. And he released it, and he did a lot of marketing with developers, because if you write developers' tools, your customers are, mar are, are developers, and you market to developers. And uh, Linus Torvalds was pretty excited about the technology. 
and ultimately Linux adopted it. And all was going well, so to speak, in the Linux project uh, until a fellow named Andrew Trigel, who was best known for doing wire analysis of the SMB protocol to write the Samba server to replace the Microsoft Windows NT systems he found in his university with a free replacement under the GPL. He said, well, I'm really good at this wire analysis thing. It's kind of my expertise. Well, let me do wireless wire analysis of the BitKeeper server, and I can write a free BitKeeper client. And he got it because he's a really brilliant developer and brilliant wire analysis engineer. He very quickly got a client working. Larry McVoy, in response, revoked all the licenses from all the people contributing to Linux, of which Andrew was one. That experience caused the Linux community to give up on BitKeeper. It caused Linus to take a break and go write something called Git. Uh, lesser known is that, in fact, the Mercurial project comes out of this area, and, or this era, rather, and the Mercurial project was started by a group of developers who were basically working separately trying to make a distributed version control system in parallel because they were concerned about the uh, BitKeeper scenario. By the way, both Git and Mercurial are members of Conservancy. So we see ourselves as an important place to be home to projects like this that are fighting the push to proprietarize, fighting for developers to be able to use free software tools to do their jobs. Now the reason this became such an important issue to me and the reason I've always felt it was an important issue for Conservancy as an organization is going back even further. SourceForge was the first platform for collaborative development online. I know if you see SourceForge now or any of its forks, which I'll talk about in a moment, you, you might wonder that. It, keep in mind it's almost 20 year old software now. But it was revolutionary, and it was developed fully in public, like a free software project, until 2002. When SourceForge Incorporated, which was a separate company then, later owned by VA Linux, later spun off into another company, decided just to take a proprietary, to stop releasing the code, since it wasn't under uh, uh, the Faro GPL, they could do that. Um, in fact, they went to every developer who'd ever contributed and demanded retroactive copyright assignment, many of which refused. Uh, because they wanted to start selling proprietary versions of SourceForge. Uh, one of the most interesting things that happened to me, uh, because I was at then working for the Free Software Foundation, I had the job that John Sullivan does now there at the time, we made our own fork at the FSF called uh, uh, Savannah that was for GNU projects who wanted to use that kind of software, but there was dozens and dozens of other forks around. And interestingly enough, somewhere around 2004, uh, I was living in a uh, Boston area at the time, uh, where the FSF is based, I went to a poker game run by a guy who turned out to work for SourceForge Incorporated, and I started, he was a sales guy, marketing guy, and I said to him, oh yeah, so you know about the history there, all that stuff, and you know, we have Savannah at the FSF, because I guess, yeah, I heard you guys ripped us off. So it was very put into the culture that they had a right to control this project, which was a community project up until 2002, and ceased to be when the company decided they wanted to take it proprietary and build a proprietary technology around it. So I thought things were better now, but many people don't know the difference between Git and GitHub in our community. Now, GitHub is not, I, I, I changed the slide, I added this word almost, um, I had also and I changed it to almost. Um, it is true that you can do a workflow now with GitHub. You can actually use most of its services with 100% free software. There's uh, two different clients that are free software that will talk to it. You can even do issues that way. But that's not how most people are interacting with it. They're not only interacting it with the command line client. Most people are interacting with it with a proprietary JavaScript application. So regardless of how you feel, uh, as John said in his talk about this area between it's not free, it's not proprietary, it's unreleased server-side software, regardless of how you feel about that issue and whether you think that software should be free, which is an issue we could debate in another talk, you must realize that most of what you're doing when you use GitHub is running proprietary JavaScript code that's downloaded to your browser and run in your browser and is not freely released to you. And we've asked uh, GitHub, uh, both the FSF, Conservancy, everybody who's a software freedom activist at one point or another has said, well, why don't you at least liberate the website code if nothing else? And of course, GitHub has said no. And as Microsoft takes them over fully, I'm sure Microsoft will say a, a stronger no. So I'm 
sorry to put this on a slide. It's annoying when old people say this, right? I, I, I understand. Um, I'm old enough now that I'm curmudgeonly going to say this to you. But I feel like that's what's happening. And I hope you'll forgive me for using a cliche for it. But I feel that we're repeating many of the battles for software freedom that we had previously succeeded at winning. I went to a conference called the Community Leadership Summit this year, which is ostensibly a conference where open source and free software community leaders meet to discuss how to better run their projects. I went to a session that was primarily about engagement of new contributors. There was a person there from a project that every person in this room has heard of. I'm not going to name it. I'll name it at, uh, at the party afterwards. But uh, th this representative's community manager from this project was explaining with great delight all of the ways you could engage with their project. She listed eight different ways. And I don't remember them all because I was busy just trying to count on my fingers the, numbers that, the number of them that were proprietary. And I got to all eight. And all eight of them required proprietary software. She listed things like, we have a Slack channel that people can come to and talk to us. We have a mailing list. And later I asked where the mailing list is hosted. It's on Google Groups. And by the way, you can't subscribe to Google Groups without proprietary JavaScript anymore. If you've just tried to subscribe to one lately. If you're grandfathered in, subscribe to the old mailing list interface, you're OK. But if you want to subscribe anew, you can't. So even the mailing list, there was no way. She said, we have a Google Hangout every week that everyone in the community is welcome to attend, if, of course, you're willing to install a proprietary Google Hangout client. She listed a whole bunch of other ones, all of which required some form of proprietary software to interact with. So John pointed me today to this essay that I'd forgotten that Mako had written uh, actually a number of years ago now, pointing out this really important issue. And in fact, Someone who works for Red Hat told me recently this about Red Hat, which is very interesting in the uh, light of the IBM acquisition this week, uh, where he said that Red Hat, we, we treat our customers so well, but we treat ourselves horribly because Red Hat has so much infrastructure internally that is all proprietary software. But we would never consider, he said at Red Hat, shipping a proprietary solution to a client ever. And that's sort of the point Mako's making here, that why is it developers say, we want you to have software freedom. We're going to license our code freely for you, but we don't want that for ourselves. You know, we, we don't care. And we'll use whatever, Hangouts, you know, GitHub, whatever. So remember I said this talk was going to be about chat. I think everybody in this room probably agrees with, if you're willing to come to a free node live, that interactive real-time chat is an essential component of free software development. Um, I've been convinced of this uh, since the earliest days of Freenode. Um, I, uh, I was in this moment where I was fr had my first free software politician job, you know, the job that John now has as executive director of FSF. I don't know if John likes being called a politician, but I think we both are, in fact. And so I sort of had this thing, of course, I've been an IRC user since the 90s, and I, so I got on Freenode and I squatted my own username because I figured, well, you know, I should make sure B Coon is B Coon because, you know, that's, you know, that's me and it should always be me in any free software context. You know, I do have a little bit of an ego. Um, and so I went and squatted my username, but I didn't log in every day because I was like, well, I should be aloof. I should be this, you know, this politician who's hard to reach. You know, I sh I should, you know, people should see that I was here once and I'm not here. Um, but then I realized that this was really the way that we were going to collaborate as a community. And that having real-time chat was absolutely essential to the advancement of free software. Um, and of course, most modern open source projects agree with that. The problem is that they pick Slack, not Freenode, to do their collaboration. So... We have this wonderful infrastructure that's been maintained for many, many years. In fact, we have, I, as I know, two competing ones, which is good. Competition is, healthy competition is good. Um, based on IRC, based on free software, server software, based on dozens and dozens of different free software client software and bots and all the stuff that we've written for IRC over the decades, all available to us as free software. And yet projects are picking Slack. So is it that we failed? Is Freenode failing? Is IRC failing? What's happening? That's an interesting question we should be asking ourselves. I think one of the reasons Freenode is so resilient, even in the face of other proprietary chat infrastructures and clients, is that the community that's running Freenode is a free software community. It is steeped in free software culture. 
it runs like a free software project, and all the software that runs on it is free software, as far as I know. And the other very interesting thing about Freenode is the amount of volunteer effort. I spent a lot of time, uh, of course, when I finally decided to get on to IRC every day back in the early 2000s, was uh, around the time uh, when uh, Lilo started using the global messages to tell everybody to give money to Freenode. And I spent a tremendous amount of time, because at that point, you know, I'm working at a charity, we're doing lots of fundraising, working with Lilo to sort of help educate the Freenode community about this, this is really the right way to raise, like there's a wrong way and a right way to raise money and you should be supported in a charitable way and everybody agrees with that and, and spent a lot of time working with that. But that's the interesting thing that developed in the Freenode culture and I'm glad to have had a small part in helping that come to be was that there should be volunteers who are treated as equals and there should be people who are sponsored by companies to support uh, important infrastructure in our community and important software in our community and that those people should meet together in one place and there shouldn't be too much power on either side so that people who are hobbyists have equal standing with people who are company employees. It's totally appropriate and good for companies to donate to support the network and support free software but we have to have this balance of how things are governed so that companies don't dominate them. And I think Freenode ha has done a good job at that as we at Conservancy try to build in our projects, sometimes successful, sometimes not, to build that kind of culture of equality, of volunteer efforts, of funded efforts, of for-profit companies not having more power than nonprofit entities and so forth. The other thing I want to point out, and this is more of a side point, but I just want to point out because I don't think the community knows how difficult this problem is for the free node volunteers. I hope I'm not going too far by saying this, but there's a tremendous amount of political work that needs to get done in any free software project. I think free node faces a lot more of it than you probably realize. One point where I'm an expert on, because I deal with a lot of, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I deal with a lot of trademark issues for projects, is when there are forks, there are fights over names, and IRC channels have names. So Freenode staff are always dealing with these kinds of fights, and they have to basically be arbiters, um, rather unfairly, of these kinds of disputes. And the, 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 the iceberg that's there of those kinds of problems is much bigger than you imagine. I'm sure all of you have seen the tip of it every once in a while. But it's a big problem, and it's a big job that they deal with. And almost any free software project has some sort of political back channel of really tough problems that get dealt with. And I think Freenode spent a lot of years dealing with those problems really well. Now, it's not that I'm just a, an IRC apologist or IRC you know, fan, fan person uh, in some sort of way. IRC is a hokey technology, uh, and there's no question about that. Uh, it's probably very hard to fix. I know that there have been updates to the protocol and things aren't as horrible as they were, uh, but it is a barrier to entry. I had uh, uh, somebody applying. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe doing an outreach internship in one of my projects this year, and the outreach intern couldn't. We had set the channel to um, to require a registered NIC because we had you know had said some spam problems on it, and the outreachy applicant couldn't figure out how to register a NIC, uh, and we had to walk her through that. Uh, so it's not the easiest technology and not the most accessible technology that is available in the world for chat. This is one of the reasons people pick Slack. Now, we can certainly say we don't care about that. I, I kind of don't. Uh, I mean, I, I, everybody I know is on Freenode and, and or OFTC, and all the people I want to talk to are always there at some point, generally speaking. I've met, I have a few colleagues that don't show up anymore because they're on their internal Slack channels for their projects, but generally speaking, everybody's there. So I don't know if I care about this problem so much, and maybe we don't either, but if we don't, we've got a lot of mindset change to inspire out in the community to encourage people to take IRC seriously as a technology that we can use as interactive chat instead of running off to Slack or some other technology. Now, I want to follow that criticism with something positive, which is that Regardless of whether or not IRC is an ugly solution and whether Freenode is difficult to use and all those sorts of questions, it is incredibly powerful for me as a software freedom activist to be able to say when someone says there is a Slack channel for this project, to say I can say safely why didn't you use Freenode because there are not enough arguments for them to be using Slack against Freenode that they, they can win that argument. 
And that's because the infrastructure is there. That's because it works. And being able to say, well, there's a cultural difference between people picking Slack and people picking Freenode, which I think is generally true. I can take that cultural difference and say, well, actually, there's a software freedom issue. There's a moral issue here, which is proprietary versus free, which, by the way, isn't your thing an open source project. Isn't that something you care about? If the alternatives didn't exist, if IRC had not survived to this point and still in wide use by many projects today, as a software freedom activist, I would be stuck because I would say, well, I don't have an alternative to offer you gee, you should help us build one. That's a much harder argument to make than there is one, it's not perfect, maybe you could use it for now and help make it better, but it'll serve your basic needs right now. Software freedom activists are now the resistance. It's very, very strange for that to be true, but it is because we went from being the complete underdogs, crazy people no one wanted to talk to, to everybody saying we had won. And in fact, they're saying we won so strongly, so loudly. Corporate people get up and give keynotes at corporate conferences. You know, the conferences we have to pay to have a keynote, which, of course, none of the keynoters here had to pay to have a keynote. We were invited because the organizers liked their ideas. But there are these conferences out there where people get up on the stage because they paid to be there, and they say, oh, you're so great out there. Open source has won. Don't you know that you've won? Don't you know that everything's open source now? I actually heard the executive director of a major trade association say, every company chooses open source first for every product. His organization is supported by Netflix and IBM and Samsung. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't know about, I don't know about you, but the last time I looked, the Netflix client was not open source. But um, in fact, it has DRM in it, I thought, but who knows. Uh, so we're living in this world where the messaging wants to tell us that everything is wonderful, that software freedom has been achieved for everyone. And th this is because we live in the age of co-option. Uh, and when you live in the age of co-option, things are a little bit more complicated. The first thing I think you have to do is to resist, to say, well, no, actually, I heard this guy, I know you think he's crazy, but I heard this guy say there's some paradox where uh, there's actually not a lot of free software to use. And by the way, all the apps on my phone are proprietary, and isn't that bad, and isn't that not winning? And by the way, I'm not going to use these proprietary technologies. I'm not going to join the Slack channel. I made an IRC channel. Come join me there. I'm not going to be on the Google Hangout. Is there a way I can dial in from a regular phone? Oh, there's not? Well, I guess I can't be on the call. Does that mean I'm not welcome in the project? That kind of resistance, you know, I sound like a crazy when I say that by myself. But lots of people saying that makes a difference. Uh, there's a guy named Arlo Guthrie. He recorded a song, a protest song in the 1960s called Alice's Restaurant. And he talks about the idea at the end of the song that resistance and protest is about having enough people, having a critical mask to get there. He talks about how if one person goes in and says, uh, of course, he ends the song by saying, the way you get out of uh, the draft is you go in and you sing Alice's Restaurant when you get your draft call and walk out, and they'll just think you're crazy, and they won't let you be in. He says, well, one person does it, they'll think they're crazy. And he goes on and keeps adding people, and he says, but if 50 people, if 50 people a day walk into the draft office and sing a bar of Alice's Restaurant and walk out, they're going to think it's a movement. And if enough people say, I'm resisting these proprietary technologies, it will be a movement again. So resistance is the most important thing. But I also want to thank people like the Freenode staff who are doing things that are running an alternative. And that's not the only thing that needs an alternative. IRC chat, online chat, it's an important aspect of free software development, but it's not the only one. So there's lots of places where we need alternatives. Uh, video chat is not there yet. There are free software technologies that work with video, video chat, but not well. It's very hard for someone to say, I have a free software project. I want a fully free place to host my chat, my video chat with my co-contributors. I don't know if that thing exists right now. You can use uh, Jitsi Meetup, but that's no, I don't know anybody who successfully cloned that site and is running a separate site that's not owned by the company behind Jitsi, which makes me a little worried. So there are lots of places where you can contribute to make those kinds of places. So there is a viable alternative. So it's not, I won't be on the chat, I need a way to phone in. It's, oh, I have this other chat server that's better. The third way is the same way we've resisted proprietary software all along. We spent years patiently developing free software alternatives to everything. Now, I know most of you that are younger developers, you didn't have to live through that era, which is incredibly painful. 
I didn't start out as a patient person. Uh, I had to become one to be able to work in free software because it requires an incredible amount of patience to slowly replace proprietary technologies with free software. Often not being ahead of the curve on technology, but being behind the curve, catching up to what proprietary people are doing with all the money that they have to fund it. So we have to develop that patience again. We have to be willing to sit and spend time as volunteers writing free software code for things that have a, quote, perfectly fine, unquote, proprietary solution that needs to be replaced. And we have to be willing to do that as developers to be able to have a fully free software ecosystem again. I know it's painful to sit far behind proprietary software and try to catch up. I've spent most of my career helping people do that. Uh, and most of the people who are my age or older in the free software world, we spent most of our careers doing that. Um, I'm sorry to ask the next generation to have to repeat our efforts, uh, but we're behind the curve again, so I kind of have to. It requires a certain discipline that, that I certainly wasn't born with myself. I wasn't a patient, disciplined person when I first got on IRC in my 20s. Um, I know that because I spent more time chatting on IRC than I did working on the research project I was supposed to be working on, and I wasn't chatting about the research project. But eventually I developed that patience and discipline, and I'm asking the next generation to do the same because that's what it takes to fight for software freedom. In that apocryphal fairy tale about the tortoise and the hare, the thing people never mention about that story is that it's really uncomfortable and not fun to be the tortoise the whole time. You're laughed at, you're not taken seriously. That is until you cross the finish line. And that's what free software is often like. We were laughed at until we crossed various different finish lines. The problem is that finish line keeps moving and different finish lines get created. So we can't just rest on our laurels of, well, we did a lot of things and look, Linux is in every Android device, but most of the time it's violating the GPL anyway. We got a ton of work to do there to get those products into compliance. And by the way, the rest of the Android stack isn't copylefted. So most of it's proprietary software anyway. And by the way, all the apps are proprietary. We've got to go be the tortoise again. And just keep in mind, the turtle does win. I don't know if we're going to end in a world with free software. I believed when I started working for the FSF back when I used to work there, when I first became a software freedom activist, I actually had the delusion that I would see universal software freedom in my lifetime. I've already decided what I'm going to say when I die. I will try to time it so that my dying words are, Oh, but I die in a world with proprietary software. Because I know that I will, even if I get to live to be in my 90s, if I could be so lucky. I don't think we're going to get it in this generation, but we have to keep fighting for it because it matters. Because we understand that the right to copy, share, modify, redistribute, improve software are fundamental rights that matter to people. And they certainly matter to developers. So that's the place to work first. Convince developers that they should care about their own software freedom if not for their users for themselves, so that they can modify the tools they use. They have all the, tool, the source code to all the tools that they rely on every day. That's how we did it before, and I think it will work again with the next generation of developers. So with that, I want to end up and just take questions. I've got plenty of time, so lots of questions if you'd like. Thank you. So someone has a mic, I think, that they're going to run to you if you have a question, or so I was told. There it is. If you, if you want to speak, get the talking stick that's there. Uh, so pardon my ignorance, but I think one of the reasons why we're seeing popularity of proprietary communication systems like Slack is because they integrate uh, things that the kids like, like emojis and pictures and things. Um, which is fabulous. Is there some way that we could work on making IRC a more millennial native experience? I am certainly well, the wrong Okay, so if it's already done, <coughs> tell me how so I can tell all the kids to use it. Yep. IRCcloud.com. And okay. is that... No, no, no. So, but hold on. So is the IRC... I'm not ask answering... Maybe I should let uh, Bradley well, answer the question and, I asked. And, 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 uh, and Leslie, obviously you know that I am the uh, wrong person to ask about what to do about millennials because, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I'm a very, you know, um, you know I, I have been accused of a certain amount of ageism. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't always get the millennial mindset. I try very hard, but, uh, you know, I'm old and curmudgeonly, and I apologize for that. Um, but I think it is difficult to connect. And I think that's part of 
what the issue was. It was difficult, I think, for the previous generation to connect with us. Somehow it worked. I don't know, what, I can tell you what worked to connect with me from the older generation, right? I can tell you that. Um, whether that works going downstream, I don't know. Um, I, I do remember that when I was in my 20s, um, the newest, greatest, exciting technology was interesting. The most interesting, newest, exciting, greatest technology when I was in my 20s was all free software. Uh, so it's certainly true that we need to start projects that people are excited about technologically. And there's lots of space to do that. Remember, there was lots of code getting written, which means cajoling your company into paying you to write exciting code and releasing it under the GPL, that's a huge contribution you can make. And I think that's going to make a bigger way to connect with millennials. Because then, if you have a really interesting code base and you don't have a Slack channel for the project, then you get the opportunity to say, we'll join IRC. And then we'll hear all the things that they feel are missing from IRC, which I think there are developers in this room who can probably make sure get added or they already exist through other interfaces to IRC. I know you could do the, the emojis. I know, you know why I don't know? Because lots of people on IRC and channels I'm in, they send me little boxes. So that must be emojis, like in my, like, in my client. Like, I, I don't care what they are because I'm old and I don't care. But, um, but I think they come through because I get them, they're little boxes. Uh, <laughs> next question. I, uh, as far as like the soft free software movement goes, how can we as activists and supporters reconcile with the fact that no matter how much free software there is out there, all the hardware we run it on is closed? It's a disaster of a problem. I agree with you. Um, I'm a huge proponent of projects that are trying to make open hardware projects. I, I hope that um, Purism will succeed in making a fully free laptop. It's very challenging. And they will. The, we need to trust but verify that effort. Uh, the FSF, uh, uh, John could tell you about a program they, they have called Respect Your, Respect Your Freedom, where they are the watchdogs of that question. That's a huge service the FSF's doing to the community, doing for the community, rather. Um, um, I, I run this, and this is where I started, right? I run this X200, and it's a very old laptop. I joke about how long it takes to come out of Hibernate. My battery only lasts two hours now. It used to last five, right? So, so at the moment, we're in a tight spot, and we have to fix it. Um, but I, I think that the only way to do that is open hardware projects and a lot of time reverse engineering that may have to happen. We used to do that, a lot of that. When I, when I remembered when I realized Linux was actually going to succeed was uh, not that long ago. It was 2006. Because in 2006 was when serial ATA took over for servers over, over you know, old parallel ATA, IDA, IDE drives. I built a server that year. And I bought all parallel cards because none of the serial ATA that was on the market was supported. So we start 2006 with, with like tons and tons of serial ATA cards on the market. None of them have a free Linux driver. Some of them have Linux drivers that are proprietary, which of course were violating GPL, and some of them had just no drivers at all. By the end of 2006, suddenly we had that, right? So it's a market question a lot of time. When there is a market pressure for free, laptop, free laptops, it will exist. I think that's why Purism was funded. That's why other... Uh, crowdfunding campaigns have been funded. Uh, I mean, people have joked that basically we've created this uh, bubble market on the X200s, right? Because, because we all want them, like, a, a lot, and they're more expensive than you would think for hardware of its era because it's the last free laptop in the world. Um, and I'm totally cool with that. Like, I don't mind having the secondary market make some money if we get software freedom. Um, but uh, we have to take both approaches at once, I think is the real answer. I don't know where the mic is, so I don't know where to look. Somebody start talking, and I'll assume yeah. I'll guess where you are. <laughs> I know. Um, do you think, with regards to communication products, it, it's uh, as much about the sort of culture as the technology? And what I mean by that is, take an example like Slack. One of the reasons I think that it appeals to many projects and to businesses alike is uh, the the culture around it being based on sort of actual names, pictures, those sorts of things. Whereas IRC was always more based around nicks, handles things that were like more anonymous. Nowadays, we seem to mostly like real names and things like that. So do you think the culture of IRC is one that a lot of people may feel is sort of anathema to the sort of business and, and maybe even project uh, work? It could be true that IRC is anathema to business, right? And that part wouldn't bother me so much, right? Because I, I think that too often we take the attitude that we have to make, uh, and this goes back to the founding of open source altogether, this idea that we should make open source because we need to be friendly to business. I think we went way too far on that side uh, in an effort to, to basically say, well, stodgy business people, you know, uh, blue-suited IBM people, they, we need them to be, want to buy our companies in our community. If they won't buy our companies in our community, 
the, the blue suit guys don't want us, like, what do we do? Um, I, so I, I'm not too worried about that business friendly part. Um, your other point, which I think is really important, is is it, does the interface look different? And that sort of goes to what Leslie's question was: like, is, is do people want a different kind of experience today? Uh, and I think you're probably correct that they do. Uh, I'm not the person to ask uh, about that. I think I, I, I'm so I'm more of a, about establishing a place where we can say this thing works and is here. We know it's not perfect, but you can come here and help make it better. And we want people to come here and help make it better rather than saying, well, we have to compete with, 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 with Slack, right? I and mean, there are projects out there that, that there's uh, Mattermost and there's a couple of others that are free software projects that attempt to compete building software that's very similar to Slack. M I'm glad they exist because we should have parallel strategies, but my feeling is that we should try to say, this is where we are today. If it's uncomfortable to you, if it's not welcoming to you, tell us how it's not welcoming and help us change it so that it is. And I think there are people that will come to the community who's willing to do that. So I, I, I think you could be right, but I, and I think that's actually a kind of a, a, a charge to people developing IRC clients to improve that, uh, it, to bring that technology friendly or to, to that kind of mindset. The mic is running this way, so. That means if you're on this side, you have a better chance of asking a question right now. <laughs> um, there seems to be um, an idea or a notion that um, a reason for using something like Slack over IRC is simply because it's new and IRC is old. Um, and there's no real um, attempt by the user to actually understand why that should, you know, why is that even a concern? Um, they just want to use Slack because it's newer. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we should not be, you know, really saying that the technology is old. We should be saying established. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something we can work on improving and so on. But how do you um, counter that sort of mindset that, you know, they won't even give it a chance because it's, it's old, so it must be useless? You know, we have to use a replacement technology. I think it's a great point. I mean, this is why you shouldn't um, hire me as a community organizer for your project, because I'm not good at doing exactly the kinds of things you're talking about, like picking the right phrasing to convince people that it's not old but established. Uh, I agree with you that's a good approach uh, for that particular issue, but uh, I wouldn't have been the person to come up with it. I wouldn't have thought of it. So, I, so I'm the wrong person to ask sort of what other things like that can we do? Um, I do think your analysis is correct that um, technology has a certain obsession with new. And I, I think this goes very deep at this point. Um, I think it actually relates to the, the question of, of phone carriers, actually. Uh, give me a second, I'll, I'll connect that. Uh, basically, this idea that you need a new mobile device every 18 months, which the carriers basically introduces a way to be able to subsidize the purchase of the phone because if they can lock you in and get you to get a new phone, then the manufacturers can produce the new device and it's kind of this conspiracy of the carrier and the, and the uh, mobile device manufacturer. There are huge problems with that environmentally and other sorts of things. Um, I, I'm not just a software freedom activist. I care about environmental issues, uh, at least somewhat. Um, and I, I have this belief that I shouldn't, shouldn't stop using hardware until it truly does not function um, because of that reason, because I don't want to put it in a landfill if it still works. There's no reason for that to happen. Um, and I use my hardware for so long that it's really going to end up in a landfill if I stop using it because no one else will, will, will use it because it's too old from their point of view. So I, I think we, on all the fronts of technology, we have to change this idea that somehow old is bad, right? And there's various ways we can do that. Probably a lot of people better than I in this room who can help come up with mechanisms to communicate that. But I agree with you completely that, that lots of old things are good. I had a bunch of slides that I cut of point, point, talking about uh, uh, buildings and the fact that we love old buildings, right? I, I looked on a Wikipedia entry and found there's like 100, uh, I forget what they call it here, of uh, you know, listed uh, buildings in Bristol alone that have buildings that were built a long, long time ago, 1700s, 1600s, that people are preserving because they're good and they're important and they're worth seeing and they're worth thinking about. And uh, uh, if you heard Lammy's talk this morning, there's music that's that old <laughs> that we think is still worth uh, reperforming and, and being involved with. And there are connections there to the way we think about free software. So I, I do think that we, we need to change that mindset. And I, I don't know how we do that with all the Silicon Valley money pumping in, because that's really what's feeding it. All this money coming into the industry saying, make new stuff. I don't care if it's good, just make it new 
and make it hopefully profitable. And I'm gonna, there's plenty of people with lots of money willing to bet on those. And until we change that, I think it's going to be tough. But we should still try because we're going to outlive that. Well, I'm, I'm free software will outlive the current VC-based software economy, I think. Well, I'm into that. Um, can we go back a little bit to the GitHub example? You were talking about the uh, web UI being proprietary software. Mm -hmm. um, did we not focus more on the data, open access to the data? So, for example, having um, APIs to access the data programmatically and having the ability to clone that data if we want any data they have on our projects. I think sometimes that's more important than having um, open source software the whole way. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's important. I'm not I'm not saying it's unimportant, uh, but having watched the SourceForge thing, uh, lots of people were able to get their uh, database dumps out of SourceForge. Um, so the data was at, was the most transparent possible because people literally got the SQL data to reload into another SourceForge engine so they could take the last version, fork it, and do that. And many projects did. Um, the fact that SourceForge continued on to be the primary code hosting site for a very long time, basically until the moment SourceForge decided to start running advertising to fund themselves, uh, and then people really gave up on SourceForge. Um, that was right around the time GitHub started, so it sort of worked out that way. But, uh, but I, I, th I think you're right. Um, my question would be, um, are we getting the data out so that we can work on a replacement to GitHub that's fully free software? Are we going to take one of the projects that are there are many out there that are fully free software that we could load into? Uh, with that data, uh, if we're if we're getting the data out to do that, I think that's great. Um, being able to get the data out just so that we have a backup when we still rely on GitHub's proprietary infrastructure to make use of that data, I'm a little dubious at the value of that. Like it's a good thing to do; it's better than not having your data. But if you have no way to uh, tomorrow overnight, so if GitHub does something horrible or goes down, just goes away. Um, you know, Microsoft buys it and decides to shut the whole business down. Um, do we have a way to actually get it up and running uh, uh, with that data immediately to keep our code projects running? I think the answer right now is no. I don't know if we had a perfect export from GitHub, if the answer would be yes. Um, so, so I'm still worried about that question. Hello. Um, so this sort of actually conveniently ties into what I was going to ask you. So um, arguably one of the things that helped adoption into Slack was the fact that at the beginning they offered gateways into IRC and XMPP, so you could use those protocols. And so that caused some people to say, well, what's the difference? I can use my same client, right? Mm -hmm. um, tying into that previous question, there's also a similar notion among at least some of the development community that having an open API is the thing that matters. If you publish and document your API, even if it's controlled by an entity and it's proprietary and they can take it away or change it, that that's all that matters. Um, so as a result, we have a lot of closed things that have a documented API, and so a lot of people seem to not care. So my question, I guess, is how do you, how do you make people care about the, um, the closed proprietary nature of APIs, which is essentially kind of like creating your own protocol, right? Um, and, pointing and having that be as much of an issue as having um, a proprietary service. So, I, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I think that there's a couple of approaches that have happened. Um, of course, there's the, you know, the Samba approach, right, which was let's, uh, let's take this what is a proprietary protocol and do wire analysis on it and re-implement it as 100% free software um, s and wait uh, and keep working really hard on that, not just wait, but keep working really hard on that for 25, 30 years. And then suddenly Microsoft today thinks Samba is the best project ever because it's keeping SMB relevant, ironically, uh, because SMB wouldn't be relevant if it weren't for Samba today. Um, so you go from being, uh, being like the worst enemy of Microsoft to being their friend because you're, you now are the main steward of this protocol that was once non-free. Uh, once locked down, once proprietary. Um, so that would be one approach you could take. We could reverse engineer GitHub's protocol and somebody could start writing a free software uh, or, or modifying one of the existing code hosting sites to talk the same protocol. That would be one option. Um, the other option is to try to force GitHub into agreeing to uh, you know, a documented API protocol. I think that's dangerous for some of the reasons you were hinting at, which is that, well, they can always go off and do their own thing. And that sort of speaks to the monoculture of GitHub, right? I mean, it's, it's that centralization question. John touched on the sum in his talk. Like, decentralization doesn't necessarily solve it. Um, but if we're all just treating GitHub as the only place you can accept a project contribution. Uh, one of the things I do on my projects is I, I accept contributions on GitHub, but I also have another code hosting site which I treat equally as a project maintainer. 
Uh, I think we should do more of that, where we're saying, well, it, you can contribute either way. It's more work for the maintainers of the project, but ensures a certain resilience that, uh, that doesn't even care about the protocols, because you're supporting the GitHub thing for the moment, but you also to accept contributions another way. Uh, there's no good solution there, though, because that, and this is the whole point. GitHub wants lock-in. And this is their big loss leader product. They say they host so many open source projects so that they can sell GitHub hosting for proprietary software. Um, ironic but true, that's, that's what they do. They, they, they bring free software-like uh, infrastructure to, uh, to that. And that's, that's reason enough to boycott it in some sense, right? Because their, their whole business model is to market off of us, volunteer developers, to say everybody in the industry uses this as a standard. You have to buy it when you want to make proprietary software. So I go back to resistance. Resistance is the best way to fight any of this stuff. Uh, refusing to use it yourself or really drawing the lines where your compromises are, like saying we will accept contributions on GitHub, but we will equally accept on another freely hosted site that we host ourselves. Uh, we'll do one final question here. Okay. Um, I'm an economist, not a software developer. Sorry about that. But um, the question of what is going to be the killer product that allows a, a free hardware and software PC or device to appear is that at the moment there's a huge gap. The so-called tech companies are controlling our information in such a way that it is impossible to use any digital device to get the latest, best available current information about any present situation from the internet. <coughs> if, we, if, if, if there were a consortium at approach to putting together something that enabled press offices to put the latest, best news material together for every working journalist on earth only through a free uh, device and free software, that would, estab that would end the cycles of built-in obsolescence that the industry actually runs on today. I mean, all of the big companies are always producing, we have not needed better chips every, as often as we do because there's a need for better technology, we get better chips because Intel makes its money that way. I mean, we have to get real about the economics of the industry. It's not delivering, it, it's not delivering the information that we need and there is an opportunity for the free software movement to build a device that is fully free and delivers information about the present such that every person in politics, every voter, every citizen can actually get the accurate, complete, current information in real time. I'm so, sorry, that so was I, not I a wish, question. I, I wish that free software could solve that problem. I'm not sure that it can. I think the interesting observation from what you're saying that, that I would love to point out to the audience is that uh, what we consider software companies, in many cases, are actually advertising companies, right? And they're, they've made tremendous uh, success using free software. So if you look at Google and Facebook, both of which are basically advertising companies, the amount of free software consumption they have, and frankly, open source contribution they have, is relatively awesome. Uh, but they certainly aren't contributing in any of the places that matter. A lot of times when I give talks, I talk about how proprietary Google Maps is and how essential Google Maps has become to a lot of people for navigation, even though there's OpenStreetMap and there is a good data set there, there aren't the level of easy to use applications around it uh, that are there uh, with Google Maps. And the reason Google Maps is still proprietary software, even though Google is ostensibly friendly to open source, is because it is a vector to which they deliver advertising. We were talking over lunch about how turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions now, they tend to tell you turn left to the McDonald's instead of turn left on street name. Uh, and that's, we're going to see more of that as time goes on. People will buy that spot in your navigation. Uh, it's for sale, certainly, from Google. And Facebook is, of course, in many ways much worse. So these companies have actually been able to exploit free software. These are some of the same companies telling us that open source is won and we're so great and we've succeeded. 
Um, but we have to be really skeptical about that question and say, what, you know, what, what did free software help make happen and how do we prevent it? Uh, I helped, um, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I helped make a license that was supposed to solve that, the Affero GPL. I think it was somewhat successful because Google has a company-wide ban on it. Um, so obviously, it, obviously they're afraid enough that they won't touch Affero GPL code, which is actually good, by the way, not bad, because it means that, that stuff under that license um, is toxic to the negative parts of Google's business model. And I don't have any problem being toxic to something that's already toxic itself. Um, that's the way free software licensing should work. It should promote and make better the things that are good and make bad the things that are already bad. Uh, we'll end with that since I know we're out of time. Thank you.